Hello, welcome back to I Care For Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. Tonight we're gonna to be talking about the science of smell, AKA olfaction. This is defined as the power to perceive odors and scents by means of the nasal cavity organs. Smell is one of our chemical senses, the other one is taste, and the perception of smell happens when chemical molecules from the environment bind to the receptors on the surface of our olfactory lobe. Receptors are fascinating. These are the gateways that allow us to interact with our environment to receive and transduce sensory signals. These are basically the bridges of perception and each sense has its own unique receptor that you can see here. You can think of it kind of like a lock and key fit with the receptor being the lock and the incoming sensory stimulation as being the key. And when they come together, they unlock human experiences of touch, vision, sound, taste, and the topic of today's smell. We have five to six million smell receptors. This makes up more than 50% of all the receptors in the human body. 400 of these olfactory receptors are unique. So that means together we are capable of perceiving over one trillion smells. Very few smells are related to one exact type of scent. They're almost always a combination of scents. What happens once these molecules enter into our nose is they basically run through uh, to an organ called the glomerus. This is a structure that then sends the signals to the olfactory bulb, which is actually the size of about a postage stamp. Very, very, very small. From the olfactory bulb, it goes through cranial nerve number one, which is the shortest cranial nerve in the brain, and it sits in the upper inside kind of back part of our nose directly above the nasal cavity, and then attaches directly into the limbic system. The limbic system is just under our frontal lobes and is most infamously associated with emotions, but the truth is it actually does a lot more. It controls many different aspects of our motivation long-term memory and smell because of its direct link right into the brain smell can be highly emotional and is often paired with very strong memories for better or for worse all of the other senses every single one is first processed by the cortex of the brain and then is sent into receptor sites now this is totally different for smell what this does with the other sense is it gives our brain, primarily the cerebellum, an opportunity to turn down the dial on perception. This is why when folks have cerebellar injury, they so often struggle with overstimulation of the senses because they don't have good control over this innate ability to kind of turn things down when they're too much. Scent works in the complete opposite direction. So with sight, sound, touch, and taste, we first identify this information, like I said, kind of cortically, you could almost think of it kind of like intellectually, subconsciously, and then we react emotionally. With scent, it's the complete opposite. We have the emotion first, and then we actually label it and process it. This is why people People who live with post-traumatic stress are often so deeply troubled and triggered by scent is because it's, it's very directly connected to our emotional perception, especially the threat detector, the amygdala in the limbic system. The smell and memory connection can be very joyful or very painful. Most famously, this was depicted in Marcel Proust's famous novel, In Search of Lost Time. You might remember this part of the story where the protagonist smells a Madeline cookie and is involuntarily transported back to a moment in time from his childhood where his aunt served him Madeline cookies and tea. And this was an extremely emotional experience that was depicted in the book. What smells for you most immediately cause memories to flood in. As I was doing the research for all of you with this lecture, I was asking myself these very questions and I realized there's many scents that I have a very strong visceral reaction to. The first one that comes to my mind is Dove Soap. So this immediately brings me back to my grandmother's bathroom. I can see every single thing in the bathroom and I'm immediately thinking about her. 
The other thing is whenever I smell a bus, I am immediately transported back to a trip I took to Spain when I was 15 and the feeling of getting up early in the morning and getting on a bus. Our memory for scents is incredibly accurate. So about 65 to 70% accuracy for most people over an entire year. But visual recall, what we see, downgrades by about 50% after just three months. So it's really, really different. The smell-taste connection is another point of interest. This is something I often hear people kind of misunderstanding. Um, taste and smell are actually two very distinct sense, senses, pardon me, but they are very intimately connected. So when we think about taste, what we're actually thinking about is flavor, and flavor is a combination of taste and smell. So when we think of taste, in addition to being um, related to smell, what really constitutes its flavor is actually the spiciness of the food, the temperature of the food, and the texture of the food. And as we chew, we are forcing air to go up into our nasal passage and the olfactory receptors are then activated. A lot of the flavor perception does come from smell, like I said. So if you have trouble with smelling, whether it's degraded a little bit or you've completely lost it, you are going to lose that ability to perceive flavor. So those folks actually tend to perceive flavor as very kind of muted and related to the five basic taste Types. They don't really get a lot of nuance or, interestingly, a lot of the joy or emotion that comes from eating. Smell is definitely the oldest sense. It goes way down the developmental line with even amoebas, one cell organisms, having a detector, almost like a receptor, that is basically uh, come as activated when it comes up against other smells. And its only job is to decide if it is friend or foe. So should I eat it? Should I destroy? it or should I move on and let it be? We very much use smell, even though it's largely unconscious, not totally, but largely, to inform our interpersonal preferences and behavior. Each human being has its own distinct smell, again, for better or worse, with one exception, and that is identical twins. So just like our fingerprints, our unique odor signature comes from the very same genes that determine a lot of different things about our genetics, specifically the type of tissues that are unique to us. I thought that was very interesting. Most of the time we think of these bodily scents as pheromones, right? And these are present in body secretions, mostly in sweat, but also in urine, breast milk, and maybe even saliva. There's some debate about that. We are capable of smelling fear, literally. We hear that statement, but it's true. We can actually perceive disgust and fear from other people's sweat. And a fascinating detail I learned is that in turn, probably through our mirror neurons, we then actually take on those feelings ourselves. So this is kind of falls under the think about who you spend your time with, because if you're spending time around people that um, tend to be super negative or run really high on being disgusted by things, you may literally by osmosis pick up those same emotions and maybe even be confused if they're yours. Our ability to smell is really important for a few different reasons. So one of the duties of the olfaction system is to signal danger, right? And this is probably related to our need to tell if food has been spoiled or if there is fire coming. Smell is really abstract, much more so than other senses. We often think about odors or scents as very complex. We have many, many different ways of describing smell, and that's one of the things I'd like you to think about after this lecture is just spend this day thinking about all the different information that is coming in through your nose. Only recently have scientists actually come up with what they believe is the definitive list of how we organize smell. And these come down to 10 different categories. So smell is very dimensional and it's definitely multiple combinations that come together to make a very specific scent. Like I said, we can detect about a trillion, but basically we believe that they fall into 10 different categories. So the first one is fragrant. So this would be perfumes, 
things that come from flowers, the smell of a rose or a peony, uh, fruity. So they consider this to be all fruit except citrus. We then have citrus. So we've got our grapefruits, our limes, our lemons, our oranges. Then we've got woody. So we've got pine. Uh, that would be the smell of grass. Uh, when you go outside in the spring and you can almost smell all the flowers coming up, uh, that's often a combination of uh, fragrant and woody. We then have chemical smells. So these are smells we often respond to with a very kind of strong feeling like, oh, this is bad to so think about bleach. We have sweet smells, things like vanilla, caramel, chocolate. We have minty and peppermint. So you can think about eucalyptus, spearmint, those kind of things. Toasty and nutty is its own category. So things like peanut butter, almonds, popcorn. We have pungent, which the examples are blue cheese, uh, cigar smoke. And then we have decayed, which is rotting meat or sour milk, bad old spoiled food. And what's very interesting is that the pungent and the decayed ones are very often paired with a pretty negative immediate emotion, which is disgust, a feeling like we wanna separate ourselves. And the very pleasant ones, fragrant citrus, think about your behavioral response to those smells, you really go in. So it's really interesting to just think about all of these kind of unconscious, pre-conscious behaviors that we have around smell. We're either really drawn towards or we are repelled against. Appreciation and comprehension of smells is culturally instilled. There are some universal human aspects of smell. There are five smells that around the world, no matter who you ask, are consistently rated as pleasant. These are orange, cinnamon, cookies, bread, and the last one gave me such a laugh. I wonder if you can guess what it is. It is crayons. Crayons are universally a very, very positive smell. So there's also smells that are uniquely kind of gross and off-putting to us, but we actually have a certain fascination with kind of a push-pull response. So I was really trying to think for me, what is one of those smells? And I definitely figured it out. And it's kind of embarrassing, honestly. And I want you to know when I do smell this smell, I immediately know it's bad, even though I secretly like it. And it is gasoline. If I go to the gas station, I do have one moment of being like, ah, oh, that's somehow pleasant, but I know it's really bad for me and my brain, so I separate myself immediately. I've also been thinking a lot about, well, what are my favorite smells? What would I really miss? And I have boiled that down to my children, so that probably goes back to the pheromone idea, and also coffee. My God, I love the smell of coffee. About 12% of adults have a smell dysfunction, and this happens across a spectrum from a little bit of degradation all the way up to a complete loss of smell. And so when this happens, it really does fall under one of these invisible disabilities because it really can affect your quality of life. Others really can't appreciate it. It clearly impacts your diet, your nutrition, what you wanna eat, but a lot of anxiety can come along with it due to safety concerns. It can also cause a lot of isolation when you think about some of the joy and the fellowship that is taken away from sitting down and eating meals with people. There's a lot of different things that can cause smell loss. So the common cold, um, even uh, COVID for a lot of people, temporarily reduce smell, nasal polyps, medications, antibiotics, some blood pressure medications, these can all alter smells, but some things can also cause long-term loss of smell. So the things I typically see as a neuropsychologist are head injuries. We have some very sensitive white matter tracks that connect the nasal cavity up to the limbic system and when someone has a very hard force uh, mechanical injury to the head, those can literally get sheared off. And so that bridge disconnects itself. We also see plenty of people coming in saying they never regained a full or complete sense of smell after COVID. 
Our sense of smell does fade with age, so about 40% of us will have a one to two standard deviation drop by the time uh, we reach the age of 80. And this is something I actually wanna focus on in my next video. So we're gonna go through all of the different smell disorders and why changes in smell perception are a part of my interview as a dementia-focused provider. It can often signal to us that there's maybe something happening in the brain that could be part of a larger syndrome that is important to identify. If you thought that this video was interesting or informative, please share it with as many people in your network. Definitely like and subscribe us on Facebook and YouTube. And I promise to see you next time with another free brain health lecture for your education and empowerment. Take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.